Welcome everybody. We're week nine already in our run plug. So we got a little bit of a heat wave this week to get us going, but nothing can stop us now that we're well on our way. So my name is Landon Hong and I'm a registered dietitian and a sports nutritionist at the downtown site um, at the Cleveland Clinic Canada. So today we're going to be talking about the nutrition essentials for runners, but in particular, we're going to talk about how it can both fuel your run, but then keep you going um, after your run as well to make sure that we're adapting to the training sessions time and time again. Okay. Okay, so we've talked about previously that our training weeks, they vary week to week, but they also vary day to day. So if you're looking at your homework, every single training day is a little bit different. We have our slow and steady runs, we have our tempo runs and our hill runs. So nutrition is going to play into that a little bit similar where we're going to vary our nutrition as well to meet the needs of each individual run. So we call this periodizing our nutrition intake. It only makes sense that for something that's going to take a lot more energy that we're going to fill that energy a little bit more and it's probably one of the biggest nutrition errors I see with athletes across the board um, is that they start to get into a routine of what they like to eat whether it's breakfast lunch dinner snacks pre-run post-run and they seem to do that every single day and that routine becomes just that it's a routine so if you can vary that knowing about the work that's coming ahead it's very advantageous in helping you get the most out of your training so every single run group that we have at our clinic right now, the Learn to Run, the 10K, and the Half Marathon, each of these groups both include a, both a combination of speed and endurance training. It's not just one. For those long runs, even the Half Marathon, we're doing 15, 20 kilometers at a time. There is still an element of speed, and whether that's in that run itself or if it's cut into the tempo runner, the hill sprints that we've been working in more recently. So we're going to talk about how those macronutrient needs change a little bit, depending on that type of training that we're doing. And then also a good place to start for sport nutrition across the board is understanding the contributors to fatigue. So what's really holding you back and what's slowing you down from reaching your full potential? What's keeping you from 2021 um, Olympics in Tokyo? So is it that our energy level wasn't high enough going into a run that we didn't fuel enough? Or is it perhaps that the run got so long that we've depleted our energy stores? Um, similarly, we can do it with hydration as well, where we were dehydrated, especially on a week like this week, dehydrated going into the run, or that our sweat losses are so great that we've become dehydrated through the duration of our run, and that is contributing to our fatigue. So really overarching theme here, nutrition for running is all about combating and preventing and really delaying that fatigue to the fullest extent. And if we're able to do that, we'll be able to really maximize the training and make sure that we're going further and getting faster, but also that we're preventing any injuries as well, because injuries tend to happen when the athlete is fatigued, whether that's because of the weather or a high training load week, if you've heard about overtraining, we've talked about that in earlier weeks as well. Um, so really preventing that fatigue is a really an important step to how the sport nutrition is gonna help you out. Okay, so what is our performance fuel? The controversy, the pendulum kind of swings. Is it high fat? Is it high carb? I'm here to tell you it's a bit of A, a bit of B. Um, the high fat and fat in general really comes in when there's a lot of oxygen present. So we call this the aerobic energy system. So if you're just sitting here right now, we're breathing in plenty of oxygen. We're not breathing too heavy. So we have lots of oxygen in our body. We're able to mobilize fat as a primary energy source and use that for fuel. So I'll put it here. Here's our walk, kind of a steady state, slow and steady, lots of fat being burned there. As we take that up to a dog and then a sprint, a carbohydrate dependence reliance is going to increase slowly over time or rapidly depending on how fast you're increasing your speed. And that's really because as you're laboring your breathing and your breathing becomes harder and harder, you're not able to get enough oxygen into your working muscles to produce the energy that you need. So because of this, our body is able to use 
anaerobic, so without oxygen, uh, energy system to turn carbohydrates into really fast energy sources. So for this reason, and for reasons we'll talk about uh, moving forward, is carbohydrates is our high energy fuel system. So limiting it is just going to limit high energy fuel. Okay, so here's another graph, I guess, that breaks down the different substrates that our body will use for energy. And across the x-axis at the bottom right here, percent of maximal oxygen uptake, that's based on our VO2 max. No need to pay attention to the numbers. It is a pretty close relationship to heart rate. And Leslie talked about heart rate in previous run, uh, our previous run club video. And it's really important to consider what our training zone is and how that will affect the substrates and energy systems that we'll use. So I'm gonna highlight some. In, Again, you don't need to pay attention to the numbers across the bottom, mainly just the highlighted zone here. So here, I've highlighted an area that's pretty close to what we expect your steady state run to be around. So when we're doing that kind of long and slow, we're not having too hard of laborious breathing, 60 to 70% of that heart rate, as Leslie had previously mentioned. And you can see the breakdown on the right-hand side here of what types of energy systems or energy storage that we're gonna tap into. So you can see there's a combination muscle glycogen here, that's stored carbohydrate that will be in our muscles, um, muscle triglycerides, and that's gonna be stored fat. And then at the bottom, plasma free fatty acids, so blood fat and plasma glucose, so blood sugar. So as you can see, the, uh, the second here and the third in the middle, there's still high reliance on using fat for this storage but starting to increase muscle glycogen and slowly increasing blood glucose as well as we're increasing that intensity. And this is really important because although we're, we do have a limited supply of muscle glycogen, about 90 minutes if we really top up our stores, if that steady state run goes long enough, even if it's at a low intensity, we still are likely to run out of muscle glycogen. Again, if I highlight this and take us up to those tempo runs and those hills where we're going above 80%, we're gonna look at a really big spike in muscle glycogen usage, whereas your muscle triglycerides and the fat in the plasma, the reliance really decreases. So as we just mentioned in that previous slide, that carbohydrate is your high intensity fuel. And if you're gonna turn it up, putting that carbohydrate in your system is gonna be really important for you being able to maintain high speeds and feel good at those high speeds as well. Okay. So I wanted to quickly touch on the concept of low carbs for running. There's many, many books out there, many people from just anecdotal experience will speak to how they love it, how they hate it, either or, but I wanted to just dip into the evidence really quickly and then you can make your choices on your own. Um, what this study said in 2017, <clears throat> sorry, was they took a group of elite race walkers. And if you're questioning if elite race walking is a real sport, just check out some of these times and I challenge you to try and match this with a sub 45 minute 10 kilometer at a walk, let alone at a run is a challenge for enough people, but these people are walking at this pace, which is a very, very incredible speed. So the gray bars here, you see their first race, and they did this 10 kilometer time just coming into the training camp. Over the next three weeks, the researchers controlled for all of their training. So they all did the same training and then they split them into three different groups based on the type of diet that they would consume. So the first group, the high carb group, consumed a very pretty high carbohydrate, eight grams per kilogram, pretty standard um, for an endurance sport. The second group, consisted of periodized carbohydrate intake. So that group would have some days that would be really high carb and some days on a low carb um, training period. And the last group had less than 50 grams of carbs per day. So virtually ketogenic, a low carb, high fat diet. And what you can see here is over that three weeks when they tested again, and these races are qualifier, qualifying races, so you know they're giving it their all. Their second race, the orange bar dropping means that their time is getting faster. So you see significant improvements in that high carb group, significant improvement in the periodized carbohydrate group, 
whereas the low carb, high fat group actually got a little bit slower. Um, I'm pretty sure that one was statistically insignificant how much slower it did get. Um, but if you're looking at those times, you would want to see them trend in a faster direction after three weeks of a training protocol. So I think that this study kind of speaks to itself on how advantageous that carbohydrate can be and really making it a priority when, when you're doing high intensity training. So where are our current recommendations right now? Carbohydrates are gonna matter when it's training volume, training intensity and training quality matter. If it is a slow day and you have a few rest days in between, maybe you're going at um, a shorter run than typical and you're just taking it nice and easy, or maybe it's just a recovery day, carbohydrates aren't gonna matter that much. Um, you're not gonna run out of your 90 minute stores. You don't need to be going full tilt. Maybe the plate on the right is something closer to what you want to be eating at. So this here is just a copy of the Canvas Food Guide and I've highlighted the sections here to contain a quarter plate of those kind of carbohydrate whole grain foods, a quarter plate protein, and a half plate of the fruits and vegetables. But as we start to increase volume, increasing intensity, increasing your training quality, we're going to increase that carbohydrate a little bit. So about 30% of your plate Again, we're not doing that at the cost of protein because that's still gonna matter in there to help prepare some of the damage that our muscles are undergoing. And if it is a really intense day, we're gonna ramp that up to 50% of our plate. This does not mean by any means that you need to carb load every single day for every single run. That periodized strategy works quite well as well. And it doesn't mean that every meal has to be like this either. But say tomorrow morning, I have a really long run coming up. Maybe I'm doing 15 kilometers. Maybe tonight is a better night to eat something with that half plate or even that third plate to get me ready for it. So a runner's diet overall should contain those carbohydrates proportional to their training demands, but also enough protein to repair their muscle damage time and time again, or maybe any underlying injuries that you're trying to recover from as well, as well as a variety of brightly colored fruits and vegetables to really provide those vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, not only to prevent deficiencies, but also to strengthen your immunity and your recovery process as well. Okay. So now we're going, we have the base diet covered, we're gonna go on run day. So the goal when we are running is to top up our energy stores to make sure we're feeling well and we're running fast, but also to provide gastrointestinal comfort where your stomach's not sloshing, but you're not having a breakthrough hunger either during your run. Because when you're running, your blood flow should be going to your working muscles. So if you are starting to break through hunger during your run, it's really a sign that you are really extremely hungry because you shouldn't be feeling that at all. So I break this down into a simple three to one strategy where you're looking at three hours or the more time before your run, your meal can be a little bit larger, but it also can be a little bit more complicated with the components being carbohydrates, protein, and fat. So this could vary depending on the person and what you're comfortable tolerating, but it could be something like a chicken wrap or yogurt with granola and fruit. And now as we move closer and closer to the start of our runtime, we're going to start to get less complicated with the meal, smaller with the meal, as well as try to make it as easy to digest as possible so it's not sloshing around in there. Um, so what we're going to do here is really try to eliminate fat, eliminate fiber, and we're going to start to decrease the amount of protein in there as well so that it's easier for it to leave our stomach and we can get that energy into our muscles as fast as possible, essentially. Um, so two hours before, maybe that looks like toast and an egg or toast and peanut butter, could be just some cereal and milk. Again, if we're trying to eliminate the fiber at this point, so it doesn't sit in our stomach too long, stick to your ribs per se, um, maybe a brand buds isn't the cereal of choice here, but something like Cheerios is perfectly fine. Um, an easy to digest carbohydrate right before your meal, could look like something like a granola bar, again, a low fiber bar, something like some fruit or some dried fruit as well would work perfectly fine. Okay, and now during a run. So this one, especially right now when it's so, so hot outside, is something that you're gonna really be considering and impacting your fatigue. But we're gonna try to maintain our blood glucose levels as we saw in that chart that divided what energy we're using blood glucose does contribute, or when you start to run out of your muscle glycogen after 90 minutes, you're gonna to start to rely on carbohydrates that are coming in from the outside because you have nothing left in your storage. So it's essentially just 
holding that uh, gas refill to your body as you drink your carbohydrate drink or whatever you choose to do. Our recommendations currently start around that 60 minute mark if you look here along the bottom x axis of this graph. So if you're going to be doing anywhere above 60 minutes, it's something to consider. If it's not going to be much longer, you might want to pass. It's really individual. You can trial it out. Always, always, always trial it in training before race day. A lot of people have stomach discomfort when taking carbohydrates in, especially if you're new to it. Um, again, your blood flow is going to your muscles. It's not going through your stomach. So it might make you feel a little bit sick at first. But there is a lot of evidence to say that slowly increasing, practicing it in training, you can train your gut to tolerate larger amounts. Um, so starting somewhere 15, maybe 30 grams, if you are doing that longer than an hour to about a two hour run is a good place to start. And what this looks like in food sources is maybe it's a half liter of sport drink, one and a half to three gels, depending on the brand. So take a look, um, energy chews like a honey stinger or a goo. Or if you wanted to do it whole foods, you could always do it something from a dried fruit that can fit comfortably in a little zippy in your, in your pocket. Um, and you can see here on the left side, anything less than 60, maybe 75 minutes, recommending a small carbohydrate milk rinse, which we'll talk about um, in the supplement section at the very end of our presentation. But yes, if you are starting to go longer duration, the reason why we need you to take some carbohydrates with you on the run is because those muscle storage of carbohydrates are gonna start getting low. And if you've ever felt like you hit a wall, all of a sudden during your run, you cross the hour mark and you bump, um, likely because those glycogen stores, like your car is stalling on the side of the road. So bringing that with you, very advantageous. And then I recommend probably taking it at the 60 minute mark and then you will prevent the bonk at the 90 minute mark. Okay, so for post-run recovery, there is a lot of emphasis, a lot of supplements um, and just media pushed in and around this area. I think that for the most part, for the purposes of our running club, if you are kind of sticking to this plan and you're not doing too much else, it doesn't need to be a high priority. It's gonna naturally happen as part of the body's recovery healing process anyways. And if you're running every other day, there's gonna be numerous meals that you eat between run A and run B. So putting it in that protein shake in your bag and making sure you hammer it as soon as you finish your run, it's, it's not gonna to do too much when you're gonna be able to hopefully get home and have a meal within maybe the hour, two hours after completing. So if your run is less than 60 minutes, if you're only training once a day, if you're running every other day, uh, I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Um, but if your time window is shrinking and there's limited opportunities to refuel between your runs or between trainings, that's when it becomes more and more important. In other words, you don't have enough time to spill up those carbohydrate stores essentially that you've burned through. But having a full day in between, a day and a half even, is plenty of time. When you are recovering, you are gonna eat a meal eventually, regardless if it's immediately after or in that one to two hours. Same thing as that um, Candice Food Guide plate that I showed previously, we're gonna focus on four R's essentially, which contain all of those components that are in the Candice Food Guide. We're gonna refuel those carbohydrate stores, refill the tank um, with muscle glycogen by eating a lot of carbohydrates, repair the muscles with a lot of protein, we're gonna rehydrate by replacing sweat losses. So that doesn't just come from water, we're sweating a lot of electrolytes as well. So on days like today, electrolytes, not a bad idea, but you can also find a lot of electrolytes in fruits and vegetables as well. Or in the carbohydrates, it could be something like a salty cracker or salted pretzels, and that's gonna to help to replace your electrolyte losses also. And last but not least, we're gonna revitalize with lots of fruits and vegetables, again, making sure we're preventing deficiency, but also enhancing the recovery process. For hydration, like it's never, it's never been as important as it is this past two weeks. We waited till 9 p.m. last night to do our run and it was still extremely hot out. So if you are starting your run hydrated, perfect. That's a great place to start. Um, but chances are you can get dehydrated very, very quickly, um, even on very short runs in temperatures like this. So we want to start our run hydrated. We're looking for pale colored urine before we go out. Nothing above a three. 
um, a same thing upon waking. If you're going to be doing morning runs, check the morning urine color and try and get some water in you right away. During your run, we're going to try to limit our dehydration to less than 2% of our body weight. We'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slide here. Um, and also how that plays into not overhydrating as well, which is a very common mistake um, with beginning, beginner runners, especially in a race setting where there's hydration stations very often, which is great to have the availability and the options, um, but then it's more options than you're typically used to probably in your training. So we also don't want to overhydrate either because that can slow us down both by stopping at the hydration station, but also we can gain weight if we're drinking too much through the duration of our run just because we're drinking more than we're losing in our sweat. And then I really encourage you to consider a carbohydrate electrolyte beverage, so Gatorade, Powerade, all the, all the classics um, for any training over an hour, but given the hot climate, taking it on high um, hot days is also advantageous. You can definitely still take one on a, on a shorter, shorter run if it's this hot out. Okay, so consequences of dehydration. Determining what 2% dehydration means for you then is gonna be important. So I put it in kilos here just for the ease of transferring it into liters, but for a 70 kilogram individual, a 2% body weight loss would equate to 1.4 kilograms lost. And this isn't at loss from the beginning of your run to your end of your run. If you have lost weight throughout this run, this is primarily through your sweat losses. And so 1.4 kilograms would mean 1.4 liters of water, so 1.4 liters of sweat, which seems like an outrageous amount, um, but very, very typical, especially today. So sweat losses can very easily range from 300 mils to two liters an hour. So you can see that going on a 10 kilometer, 12, 15 kilometer run, but not, although not even like full, full, marathon or half marathon distances um, and doing it still under an hour, um, you can see how 1.4 liters you can quickly add up to 2% of your body weight loss. And if you look at the chart over here on the right, at 2%, you're already having an impaired cognitive and physical performance. So not only is it just making the effort feel harder mentally, but physically your muscles start to, to weaken as well. And you're not able to generate the same amount of power and you're not able to mobilize your energy source as well either because water is a component of your blood and blood is what's carrying the blood sugar. So considering how dehydration is so integrated into fatigue, and in our performance overall. You can see how it can quickly jump from 2% to 4%, especially if you are a heavy sweater or going for a very long run. So reduced intensity of um, endurance capacity by greater than 10% is massive. Um, and these get, become very dangerous very, very quickly. So if you don't run with a water bottle right now, I encourage you to do so, especially, especially in this temperature. So I have broken it down into what a sample eating day can look like. And a good rule of thumb is eating something every three to four hours. And then I'd say the one of the biggest key to successes in sport nutrition is your ability to time manage and just plan ahead. If you're looking at what's my runs like this week or what's my run like later today, you can backtrack and count backwards. When do I need to eat a snack? It's really just thinking about when, when can I eat next? Um, so if breakfast is typically at 8 a.m., say that's that balanced plate with Greek yogurt as your protein, fruit and granola um, for your carbohydrates there. Put four hours in between here, a 12 o'clock lunch. We put some protein in with the black beans, some whole grains, um, and some vegetables. And now I'm looking, if I eliminated both of these two snacks, I would be eating lunch at 12, and then there would be five and a half hours between my lunch and my run. So that's a long time, it's longer than four hours and I'm bound to either be very hungry before I start my run and then be worried that I need to eat a lot and then feel uncomfortable or be getting that breakthrough hunger during my run, which is also very uncomfortable and probably under fueled as well. So I put in a snack at the three o'clock mark. This could look like crackers and hummus, something pretty light. Um, again, it has a little bit of salt, so it could be helpful to help have some electrolytes in your body to get, get it started. Um, but I also inserted a little bit of a snack at 4.30. I'm someone who likes to eat all of the time, so adding an extra snack is no problem. 
Um, and the applesauce here, primarily, just carbohydrates. And I like it as well, not only that it's cold, um, but it's also a liquid. So it digests and leaves the stomach very quickly and it's not gonna feel sloppy in your stomach. It's gonna enter your blood sugar very quickly where you can use it as energy. And it also gives your brain a good boost. If you felt hangry ever in your life, which most people have, as soon as that food hits your mouth, it's like, ah. Uh. So if you can have something small like an applesauce, even if it's a mouth um, swish of, that carbohydrate sport drink feels a lot better. Maybe it's a shot of orange juice even just to, to wake you up and get you out the door. Um, something easy, some carbohydrate there for you. And then you'll notice that I didn't put um, a recovery snack per se, right at six o'clock as soon as the run is finished, but wait, time for a shower, hop out, and now there's vegetables, chicken and brown rice, and that can count as the recovery. We have the replenishing of glycogen, we have the repair of the muscles, and we also have the antioxidants in there as well. And I would continue to drink water then throughout the evening. I also included water as the beverage of choice through the run. It is only a 30 minute run that I included here. Up to you again, if you're feeling like you are having massive sweat losses because it's like 40 degrees outside, you could mix that, either do half and half, have a little bit of um, sport drink, a little bit of water, um, but water is probably fine if the duration is short enough. Okay, and sports supplements. So again, a lot of money and time goes into both creating, researching, and marketing supplements to the public. Um, unfortunately, there is very, very few of them that are evidence to work, and I really caution about spending your money on, on a variety of supplements, and mainly because, yes, there's not a lot of evidence to support them, but also the regulation of them is quite poor. Um, so if you are going to buy a supplement of any type, I recommend using a third-party vendor, something like NSF certified, informed sport, or also under the umbrella of informed sport is informed choice as well. Um, and these vendors can make sure that your labels are accurate. So they don't contain substances that would appear on the prohibited list, but they also aren't just contaminated with other supplements as well, because if you're taking caffeine, you'd like to know that you're getting caffeine, um, especially what, as much money as they, these supplements sometimes cost. So under the caffeine umbrella, good news for caffeine lovers, um, coffee works as well. And the amounts to get performance benefit aren't that large. So around three milligrams per kilogram. Um, and that looks like a cup of coffee. So what I like to do is freeze coffee into ice cubes. And then you can add that into smoothies and blend it up. And that can be your, your pre-workout um, with the carbohydrates. So something with banana. The carbohydrate mouth rinses. I kind of um, alluded to it a little bit earlier where it is basically just that brain sensation. And researchers don't understand it completely yet. Um, but when you do a carbohydrate mouth rinse, really like Listerine, to swish it around in your mouth, there is like happy signals that go off in your brain and they allow an individual to run faster and farther. Um, the perception of fatigue is less. So, so there is evidence and we are encouraging athletes now. So if you aren't gonna stop and take a full drink at a hydration station, even just to take it, swish it and spit it, um, shows some benefit as well. Magnesium supplements. They're only going to work if you are magnesium deficient. So, of course, I'm going to recommend that you do something food-wise to increase your magnesium first. Whole grains, nuts, seeds, fish, vegetables, dark greens in particular, very high in magnesium. And if you are someone that's finding that your muscles are cramping a lot, try some of the recommendations from the other weeks as well to really get to the bottom of it. Is it that your stretching could use some work or perhaps you're missing some of your hydration and it's your water and your salt losses from your sweat that are really taking a hit. If you do determine that you have a magnesium deficiency, again, just look for a supplement that's been third party tested. Um, and the last supplement I'll discuss is beetroot juice and good news for recreational runners is that there's more evidence for the use of beetroot juice in recreational runners versus elite runners. Um, maybe because they're at their performance ceiling already and there's not much more that can help them, but um, there is some good evidence that beetroot juice, which contains nitrate, nitrates, um, which will allow your blood vessels to dilate and increase the blood flow and the oxygen to your working muscles. So another way to combat fatigue and makes your effort feel like less effort. 
So other things that contain nitrates besides beetroot juice are just the beets in general. Arugula is really high, spinach is pretty good, and celery is great as well. So arugula beet salad is pretty classic, eating a high nitrate diet one to three days ahead of time. Um, maybe it's before a race. They, it can be advantageous in improving your, your running speeds. Okay, so take home messages, top nutrition tips. Prioritize those carbohydrates, don't limit them. You can still get the job done on a high fat diet. It's just gonna feel a lot, a lot harder. I always compare it to you're starting the race right next to somebody, but you have a bike and they're running with a parachute on their back. They can get to the end. It's just, it's gonna feel a lot harder for them. Um, so really prioritize your carbs when your training quality is going to matter um, and make sure that you support that high intensity training. Especially today, I'll say it once, I'll say it again, um, staying hydrated before, during, and after your run is so, so important, Extre extremely underrated, and very few supplements are proven effective. Um, they have very small effects on performance. We're talking maybe 1%, 2%, 3% max. Um, and in the absence of a good baseline diet, they're not worth your time. Okay, so coming up to the homework this week, and then I'll take questions in the chat. Um, the Learn to Run group, we're doing nine minutes of running, one minute of walking, three repeats, and three to four times in the week. 10K group, we're going up to tempo runs, six kilometers at a tempo speed, four kilometer steady run, that'll be a nice change, and nine kilometer steady run. And half marathons, you're moving up. You got nine kilometers steady, five kilometers tempo, seven steady, and then a last 18 kilometers steady. I hope the heat breaks for you guys. Okay, so I'm gonna open up the chat here for you. I'm also gonna leave my email on the screen here. If you do have any questions that you don't wanna put in the chat, you can always email me as well. Um, but I'm just gonna open this up here. Okay, I see. I like to run in the mornings before breakfast. Is there anything you'd recommend I eat the night before? So for sure, so especially morning runs are nice. Not only is it a little less hot, but also it can feel nice to run light as well and not have something in your stomach. Run the night before, I would say doing that moderate to heavy plate will be recommended because you're going to be running off of your energy stores from the previous day so having whatever type of grain that you like whether it be rice or potatoes pasta quinoa as long as the relative proportions on your plate are about 50 40 percent um, i think that that's more than enough to get you through if it is going to be a harder run or a really long run that you're doing um, before breakfast the next day i'd say taking that carbohydrate drink with you again, or even taking just a small small glass of juice um, could help just to top up your stores. Because what happens is your, the muscle glycogen I discussed has a lot of your stored carbohydrates, but your liver also does store carbohydrates as well. And overnight, your liver stores are going to be depleted in order to keep blood glucose going to your brain. So when you wake up, your liver stores are depleted, but your muscle is still pretty good. So if you want, and if that run's going to go a little bit longer, you might want to top up some of those stores just slightly by having something small and light. Um, but if it is going to be a shorter run, then no problem at all. <laughs> 